Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to the Reed Gain Travel Technologies Limited Q4 FY22 Earnings Conference Call. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in listen-only mode. There will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchdown phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Bhano Chopra, Chairman and Managing Director, Raidkin Travel Technologies Limited. Thank you and over to you, sir. Thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining the earnings call for Raidkin Travel Technologies Limited for the financial year ended March 31st, 2022. We are very excited to meet all of you again and share with you how the last one year has been, what is driving growth for us, and where we are headed. Joining me on the call are uh, Mr. Tanmay Das, the CFO of Raidgain, Mr. Ankit Chaturvedi, our global head of marketing, Mr. Thomas Joshua, company secretary of the company, and alongside we have our in investor relations partner, strategic growth advisor. So we announced our annual and fourth quarter results yesterday, and I hope you've had a chance to go through our financial results, press release, and investor presentation that are available on the stock exchanges and on our company website. So as we start, it is important for everyone on this call to understand what we have really achieved in the last one year. So there are very few years in the entire trajectory of a company when you go through multiple transformations. And FY22 will always be a special year in the history of Radiate as it stands as a testament what a culture of collaboration, nurturing talent, and innovation can achieve. So a few high points that I'd like to share with you, with all of you. Uh, first off, on a run rate basis now, we're exceeding our pre-COVID annual recurring revenue by 8%, which was last achieved in fiscal year 20, which was pre-COVID. And so it is the highest in the history of the company. We launched three new industry-leading products completely built in-house, powered by AI to serve the new use cases as the industry moves towards digitization, and we see very good adoption across all of these products. We now have an end-to-end -end digital marketing platform under our MarTech business to help hotels drive higher ROAS and brand engagement. One of the things we talk about is always our ability to mine our large customer base. And we were able to do that this year and improve that penetration of this customer base. And I increased our revenue from existing customers by 14%. So for those of you who are joining us for the first time and would like to understand more about Radegain, we are a provider of SaaS solutions that work with close to 2,400 travel and hospitality companies to help them maximize revenue through AI-powered SaaS solutions. Every day, our solutions are used by the leading 23 of 30 hotel chains of the world, the 25 out of the top 30 largest online travel companies of the world, all the leading car rentals of the world, airlines and tour operators to engage, acquire, retain guests, and also drive wallet share expansion with them. So our business internally is aligned around three major segments. Uh, data as a service that provides competitive insights around pricing, demand, and now also we have an end-to-end -end pricing platform. Our second business line is distribution that provides connectivity to our customers, that is hoteliers, to get travel demand from OTAs as well as GDSs, which are the tra traditional travel agent system. Our third business line is MarTech which is the end-to-end -end digital marketing platform to digitally acquire customers, elevate brand equity through brand education, awareness, and engagement. So now let me also talk about the global travel health. So as we all know, COVID has now really entered the endemic stage. If you think about it, all of us are traveling now, and the impact of COVID seems to have subsided and entered the endemic stage. So it has really been impacted given the changing attitude towards COVID. So if you look at 
earning reports from leading hotel chains and our own numbers, we are seeing that leisure travel is touching 2019 levels and in some cases it's being reported that leisure travel is actually higher than 2019 levels in certain key markets such as US and Mexico. So as we had indicated earlier, US was first to open, but because of the booster vaccination programs in Asia and European countries, it has really helped international travel resume, and we're expecting the 2022 summer to help in accelerating recovery and go beyond 2019 levels in these regions. The conflict in Europe continues to have lesser impact in deterring travel plans as Western and Central Europe are seeing a 500% increase in bookings on our systems despite of hotels and airline prices also rising. So some of the macro level economic changes that are impacting the industry that I've touched upon earlier as well, and I would like to revisit, you know, there is a structural shift happening in our industry. We've all heard of the great resignation in US, there are labor shortages. And also, just like other industries, we are seeing a faster digital adoption in travel and hospitality. So thus, we see acceleration of adoption of our new AIML-based products. This has really been the heart and soul of what we've been working on and see acceleration of new product development at Radiate. This is also helping the elevate the positioning of the company as an innovative leader for the industry to capture this revenge travel demand. We continue to focus on innovation and working on solutions to help our customers engage better with guests and also lead to wallet share expansion. I'll be happy to share more on this in upcoming quarters. So now let me take you through each of our business lines. So I'll start off with MarTech. The MarTech business unit has a recurring revenue of 98% and now contributes 33% of our overall revenue. Growth has been driven by an increase in existing volumes in our meta search product, which grew by 175% year on year on net revenue. The business unit continues to see considerable demand for its meta search offerings as more hotels try to optimize costs, improve ROI, and generate direct revenue through meta search platforms to reduce cost of customer acquisition. FY22 was a year when our market division really recovered from the pandemic and delivered the biggest sales in the history of the division. The immediate focus of the company is to continue to build on this momentum and increase penetration in our existing client base as we look at building an end-to-end -end digital marketing platform which will allow hotels to get, get a unique platform, manage and drive performance across all digital channels. It's the only platform that allows both connectivity and optimization to meta search channels, and this is also our 10x differentiator against our competition. It's the only platform that uses demand forecasting data to provide smart insights to improve return on ad spend. Our distribution business segment also continue to grow with recurring revenue of 97.2% and contributed to 38% of the revenue in fiscal year 22, with our volumes now even higher than 2019 levels. We enable 50 plus new pairings between existing supply partners and demand partners, which helped in driving growth. This included connecting the top five hotel chains of the world to regional leading OTAs such as Rakuten, as well as new emerging OTAs such as Hopper, that is now the fastest growing mobile first travel application in the US. The TAS business unit registered strong growth in its airline and OTA customer segments on the back of acquiring marquee customers as well as expansion of volumes in our existing OTA customers. We, we saw one of the largest hotel chains in Latin America, Caesars Entertainment in the United States, one of the top 10 airlines in the US and many more. The recurring revenue for this business was 97.1% and contributed to 29% of the revenue in FI22. Radiant's new AI-powered products, Rev AI, Content AI, and Demand AI, launched as part of RG Labs have backed leaders in their respective segments. Content AI and Demand AI have been selected by one of the largest operators of hotels in Germany and one of the largest hotel chains in Spain, respectively. Rev AI continues to onboard car rental franchises to solve the problem of automation and revenue max maximization and was also selected by Budget Rental Cars, largest franchisee in the United States. 
uh, in terms of awards and recognition, our people, our products, and our commitment to our customers have all been recognized this year, making FY22 the biggest year in terms of award wins as well. We were recognized by both Booking.com and Expedia.com as a premier and preferred connectivity partner. We achieved the distinction with Booking.com for a fifth year in the row. We continue to show our excellence in innovation by winning four awards for Demand AI, Content AI, and PCV at the recently concluded HSMAI ADN Awards that recognizes the best technology and talent from the industry. We won top honors at Hotel Tech Awards which recognizes the best products voted by over 100,000 plus hoteliers and came in as first runners up in rate intelligence, parity, and channel manager categories, as well as finish as one of the most loved companies of 2022. On the people front, we were recognized as a great place to work for a third year in a row and awarded as the best employer brand as well by the World HRD Congress. I'd like to now ask our CFO, Mr. Tanvay Das, to take you through the performance of the year. Thank you, Banu, and a very warm welcome to everyone on this call. It has been a strong quarter and a historical year for rate gain. Our strong fundamentals and steady improvement in key KPIs is a testament to our business model. Rate gain's performance showcases how new age tech companies can drive growth as well as profitability in a tough macro environment. The global environment is improving in favor of travel, even though macroeconomic uncertainties continue to persist due to multiple factors. However, high demand shows the industry has grown resilient. Due to seasonality of our business, due to travel booking patterns throughout the year, it's more relevant to see year-over-year -year performance rather than quarterly sequential performance. Uh, talking about the financial highlights of Q4 FY22, our top line registered a growth of 51% year-over-year. Adjusted EBITDA margin achieved was 11.7%, registering a growth of 66% year-over-year, indicating margin expansion due to growth. The growth has, was aided by 101% growth in new contract loans compared to the same quarter in the previous fiscal year, and some large contracts signed in each of our businesses. The EBITDA margins of Q4 was higher than expected by 50 basis points due to delay in hiring few positions, which will spill over to Q1 of FY423. On similar lines, the revenues for FY22 registered a growth of 46% over FY21. Adjusted EBITDA margin improved to 10.3% as against 9.4% in corresponding previous year, registering a 59% growth. After two years of negative PAT reported, we returned to a positive PAT this year, registering 116.1 million and 84.2 million PAT for Q4 FY22 and FY22 respectively. The adjusted PAT after adding back amortization of acquisition cost stood at 117.8 million, which is 16.5% of revenue for Q4, and 317.9 million, which is 8.7% of revenue for FY22, registering multifold growth. Our revenue model remains highly predictable, scalable, recurring, and resilient. The gross revenue retention is 90%. While the net revenue ret retention stands at 114%, indicating low churn and expansion of our existing relationships. The recurring revenues across all our businesses ranged from 97 to 99%. 75% of our revenue came from subscription revenue. Leisure travel dominated the revenue by type of travel, standing at 95%. US remained our largest market with 62% revenue contribution, followed by Europe at 24%. Another metric that we feel extremely proud about is our LTV to CAC ratio, which stands for far above the industry benchmark at 12.9, which improved from 11.9 last quarter. During the quarter, we have repaid all our borrowings utilizing IPO proceeds and have become completely debt-free, which will result in higher PAT going forward. In respect of uh, guidance for FY23, we expect to grow our revenue around 30% organically, in terms of EBITDA margins, we expect to improve our margins to around 12.5% for FY23 as against 10.3% in FY22. Our business needs to be looked at annual basis. Q4 is our strongest quarter, whereas Q1 is our weakest quarter, both from revenue and profitability perspective. The EBITDA will gradually grow from around 10% in Q1 to around 14% in Q4, which is an increase of 200 basis points each quarter when compared to annual basis. With this, uh, I'll open the floor for Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. 
Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on their touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. The first question is from the line of Praveen Sahai from Edelweiss Financial. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you for taking my question. Uh, so as you had guided for 30% of organic growth, can you a uh, bit elaborate on your uh, segment wise? Uh, so like uh, how much of the MarTech or uh, distribution uh, expected to grow organically? So uh, we have been giving guidance of DAS segment growing around 15 to 20%, uh, this, uh, distribution 20 to 25%, and MarTech 50%. Uh, we don't see that mit, uh, mix changing. Uh, it will be the same mix. Oh, okay. And uh, second question is your hybrid, uh, uh, you know, revenue contribution is increasing. So uh, where you uh, wanted to see this contribution to go? I think the hybrid and subscription are the similar in nature. Hybrid is where we charge a minimum subscription fee and we also charge for excess usage. Uh, right, so I would probably keep them in the same bucket, which is around a 75% subscription revenue. My uh, growth uh, uh, will, will you know, I am expecting my market to grow, uh, you know, more than distribution uh, business. The subscription revenue uh, contribution will increase further. So, is there any, uh, you know, the same customer moving to the hybrid? Is it like also happening, like from your existing model, the person moving to an, a hybrid model, because that's a mix of a both. So is it also mm. happening? No, it, the same customer is not moving to hybrid. I think hybrid is increasing primarily because of the increase in volume. So uh, as travel is coming back, more people get more data, like OTAs and car rentals and airlines. I think that's because of that. Uh, the hybrid uh, percentage is increasing. Okay, and one clarification: uh, as the rate, uh, the fare uh, for airfare or uh, the hotel room rate is increasing, is that also going to impact your revenue in positive way? Our pricing model as are not um, linked to uh, airlines or hotel revenues. Uh, as such, if you talk about the ADRs, they are more linked to volume. So, number of uh, in, increase in number of bookings that will improve our uh, revenue, uh, but not uh, the average price increase. Okay, okay. Uh, just a last question, sir. Uh, as you had mentioned, that the Q4 uh, being an uh, strongest quarter. Can you bit elaborate that? Why is it so? So the, the way um, the world travels, generally in Q1, uh, generally the, all the travel plans happens in Q4. So the bookings happens majorly in Q4 uh, for, for all. And uh, also the Q4 is, is, uh, is the first quarter of the budget year for many companies which are in US and Europe. So the spending happens more in Q1. So that's how we experience that our Q4 is always strongest than, stronger than you know rest of the quarters. Okay, it's a more to do with the industry, travel industry. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'll just I'll just add it's largely in Q1 is when, you know, when you think about leisure travel, a lot of the bookings happen for summer, um, and that's why we see that trend. Okay, but uh, as you are moving to the subscription or the hybrid model, uh, so that will... Uh, yeah, the subscription eventually... hybrid model uh, remains uh, constant uh, in terms of pattern. Uh, we might see some hike in subscription model uh, when we see more wins in Q4. Uh, but from a transaction pers perspective, like we have 25% revenue dependent upon transactions, those are higher in Q4. Uh, than the rest of the quarter. Okay, okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you for uh, taking my questions.
Thank you very Welcome. much. Participants, we request you to limit your questions to two per participant. If you have any quest further questions, you may please join the queue back. The next question is from the line of Debutro Sinha from ICICI Securities. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you for taking my question, sir. So I would like to know a bit more about the business. Uh, so who are the target customers uh, for your company? Is it the hotels or the travelers? And in case it is the hotels, like uh, what segment of hotels are you targeting? And in case it is the travelers, is it domestic travelers or international travelers? Sure. So, we are a B2B company. So, our customers are basically people who are either what are referred to as travel suppliers or travel intermediaries uh, in the travel ecosystem that ultimately serve the travelers. So, we don't deal directly with the traveler or the consumer. We provide solutions to these B2B companies, which enable them to acquire the traveler, retain and engage with them, and have a wallet share expansion with them. So if you think about who our customers are specifically, you know, it's these hotel companies, it's the airlines, it's the car rental companies, um, it's uh, these intermediaries, which are the online travel agents, also tour operators, cruise liners, uh, and now we also deal with vacation rental companies that you see on Airbnb. Okay, thank you, sir. So one more question. So in that case, do you provide any packages, entire holiday packages, including traveling and lodging and uh, everything included? So um, we, we actually don't, you know, we don't do the packaging and it depends on it actually depends on the supplier. Are they using pre-packaged products to sell or are they using, uh, you know, dynamic packaging on their own website? But what do what we do provide is the uh, availability of rates and, uh, and, and, and availability of the hotels that they can put together in the package through the distribution platform that we have. Okay, sir. So, so uh, uh, Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. I would request you to please come back in the queue. Yeah, I'll come back on the line. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question is from the line of Nilesh Jaitani from BOI Mutual Funds. Please go ahead. Um, hi. Good afternoon, Manu, and thanks for the opportunity. Uh, my question was on this MarTech business. So just when I was uh, reverse calculating on average clients for FI22 and our earnings, uh, the number comes at around 45000 to $50,000 earning per client. Uh, so I wanted to understand when we sign up, what is the bare minimum we ask for the client for the MarTech business? What are the opportunities to ramp up? Say if client wants to increase its spending, does it impact our uh, profitability on a, in a better way? Or we are we charge us the fixed amount for the entire year, and then whatever client requires us, we just do the uh, gross up and build the client whatever actual expenses are. Can you please explain that business? Sure. So let me um, first talk through, you know, what is the Martech business, and get into a little bit more details there, and then I'll let uh, Tanmay step in and talk about, you know, how do we price our offering. So. You know, our MarTech offering is really, you know, think about it, simply put, it's, our, it's, a, it's an end-to-end -end digital marketing platform. And if you think about marketing, it enables you to do two things, right? It enables you to acquire customers or travelers or guests. And two, it does brand engagement. So we do this on, you know, the entire of gamut of digital channels that are available whether they are social channels like Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, or, you know, they're the traditional digital marketing channels like the Google, PPC. Uh, and in the case of travel, another important digital channel is what is called meta search sites. These are price comparison sites, which I'm sure most of you have used uh, also, which also, whose business model is also like a, Google model, which is an ad model. So we basically enable our customers to acquire guests 
and drive traffic to their own website to any of these digital channels. The second thing that we do in our MarTech platform is we also do brand engagement. As you know, social selling has become extremely important if you were to target the millennial customer. So we do a lot of brand engagement where we advertise and talk about all the new things that are happening at the hotel, what are the different offers that they have, and also monitor and engage with guests on a real-time basis as and when they put out commentary about the particular hotel. So um, it could be while they're at the hotel or they're looking you know, to book a stay where we're engaging with the customer. So what we do is we do offer each of these components at different modules and the pricing of each is different. Uh, and I'll let uh, Tanmi come in and talk about how different modules are priced. Sure, Banu. So on, on Martek, look, as, as Banu was talking about, like we uh, cater to like Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, so the, the customer can choose what level of scope uh, of solution he wants to take. Uh, I think the, the $45,000 you talked about, I think what you probably have done is that you've taken the uh, total Martek revenue and divided by customer, but I think in Martek we provide two uh, separate uh, solution. One is the BCV solution and the other is the My Hotel solution. I think it, the, the average price is more uh, relevant to the BCV solution where the average price per property that we charge is around $25,000. But there are graded solution levels that they can get into. I think it starts with $15,000. Some hotels pay us even more than fifty dollars to $60,000. So it it's depends upon what level of solution they take. And obviously, you know, once they get in at a smaller price, if if they want to avail more solutions, then uh, the price increases. Got it. That was really helpful. Uh, and my second question is on the overall margin. So in the initial comment, you uh, said that the two high margin uh, subscription based business will grow in the range of 15 and 20 percent respectively but martech will grow at 50 so how confident are you to taking our overall company's EBITDA levels to mid teens in the next one or two years if martech growth would come at a very higher pace vis-a-vis -vis the saas business i think yes uh, the the martech uh, gross margins are around 60 percent which is uh, at a at a pretty high level when you talk about a SaaS company gross margin is around 63%. Uh, a IT services company uh, gross margins are around 40%. So even if I grow Martech 50% uh, year over year with a 60% gross margin, you know, quite a chunk of growth will flow down to a bit up, right? Uh, and and obviously, DAS and distribution both are pure platform plays, and you know, with a 90% gross margin, their growth will flow down to a bit up. So. Uh, as, as, as we are giving a guidance of 200 basis point increase uh, year over year, um, that's what we are targeting to. And we're you know, pretty confident about that. But wouldn't, uh, sorry, well, last question from my side, but wouldn't uh, yes, such sir. growth in... So I would please uh, request you to please come, in, come back in the queue. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Participants, please limit your questions to two per person. The next question is from the line of Prolin Nandu from GMO. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah. Hi, Vanu and Tanmay. Thank you for this update on uh, your quarterly and yearly performance. So two broad questions. One is on the operating matrix that you say, right, in terms of uh, net retention rate and uh, uh, CAC to LTV uh, or LTV to CAC. I just wanted to understand uh, what is our aspiration, uh, whom are we benchmarking against uh, in terms of uh, you know, uh, uh, in terms of uh, the numbers where we want to see these numbers in a couple of years' time. And on this, uh, I, I was a bit perplexed that uh, uh, our net retention rate of 120%, which we reported in nine months, have dropped to 114% in the strongest quarter, uh, you know, uh, Q4. So could you uh, help us understand, could you help me understand these two uh, broad questions on your operating uh, uh, matrix? So, so the benchmarks for SaaS companies uh, for net retention rate is 115 to 120% is a good benchmark. Uh, as far as LTV to CAC is concerned, anything three to five is a is a is a great benchmark. But we are, you know, in net retention we are at par in in LTV to CAC 
it's 12.9 uh, uh, which is much much better than saas benchmarks but you know considering many saas companies don't uh, make profits and we are profitable so the the 12.9 is resonates well i think it's 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 at a, at a very fairly level, fair level from a net retention perspective we i would love to increase that from 115 to 120% uh, in future quarters your question of reduction in net retention rate is that look i my gross retention rate is at 90% uh, it, it was around 91% last quarter so we have not churned a lot uh the factor is that we had some great uh, new sales uh from uh, uh, which which contributed to revenue growth so both uh, we had a very good q4 q3 uh it was the highest in the history of red gain and then we also had a very good q4 so there are new logos that has been added uh, so that's probably is decreasing the net retention rate uh, because if you see the churn rates are not uh, gone gone down significantly but i i am sorry but i mean uh, just on this i thought that the new retention rate should not impact your net retention rate right because that's old customer let's say if he was giving you 100 rupees uh, without any uh, adding uh, anything you would be getting 20 rupees right so i i had a uh, understanding that your new uh, client acquisition should not uh, actually impact your nrr or am i wrong in that understanding oh uh... no i think i think i think I'm, i was i was answering from a revenue growth perspective that why my net retention is around 114% whereas uh, my growth is around 46% so i was probably answering from that perspective but i think you're right uh, you know 114% uh, is what the net retention rate is we um, maybe maybe i'll just uh, uh recircle back with you with with it because you know and, uh, why uh, tanmay i'm harping on this is that your 9 months retention rate was at 120 for you to report a full year nrr of 114 there has to be a significant drop in q4 is i mean you know is my understanding so again you know a bit uh, if you can circle back that would be great right i mean on this number yeah i'll i'll, I'll take you connect from sg and i'll circle back to you great and uh, you know second question you know you have given a, a fy23 uh, evita margin expansion of 200 base right in some sense so uh, slightly more medium term questions on margin and margin and uh, operating leverage right in some sense uh, could you help us understand uh, you know what are the levers wherein you know uh, we can increase revenue per uh, employee uh, we can uh, spread out the other costs and how the depreciation and amortization will also normalize over the few years right not not in terms of quantity i'm not looking for a number for fy 24 25 but in medium term in 2 to 3 years time how will these three major cost item uh, look like as a percentage of sales uh, going forward yeah so uh, we currently um, you know at the end of the day we sh- we are still a very small company right and and there is a huge market to tap into and and we can grow really fast so we we have been investing in our sales and distribution network where we spend almost 20% of our revenue we are spending 5% on uh, on innovations uh, which rj labs banu talked about because we want to get more new age products which will propel growth uh, and uh, so those those are the investments uh, once the growth happens those are the investments in terms of percentage of revenue will go down now if you look at my revenue per employee it has increased 17% year over year in fact pre covid when i was uh, we, we were around a 400 crore company um, the the number of employees we had was around 630 640 people and today we have exceeded the run rate revenue by 8% the, the annual recurring revenue is around 435 crore we have only 606 people so there is definite synergies that will be, you know, come in when the growth happens uh, all the all the segment of costs like we we'll talk about sgna or sales and marketing or uh, investment into into in the new products in terms of percentage of revenue will come down when the you know growth up you know when the growth comes uh, thanks and i'll come back in the queue Thank you very much, Berlin. Uh, the next question is from the line of Samir Dosani from ICICI Prudential Asset Management. Please go ahead. 
thanks for the opportunity just uh, two questions one when i look at dash revenue on a q on q basis we see there is a 20% degrowth uh, on a q on q basis uh, could you explain that, uh, that and second also when you when you look at cross margins when i compare it compare fy22 to fy21 there's a 3.5% drop in the gross margins so can you can you just explain uh, both these things I, I'm not sure about the first question because what I see is a if you're comparing Q3 FY22 versus Q4 FY22, uh, I think there's a five percent increase. Whatever, but how, uh, you know, at the end of the day, DAS or any of the businesses uh, have not declined quarter over quarter. Maybe if you have a different calculation, we can touch base offline. But from uh, what I see or what what the numbers I have. Is a five percent sequential increase uh, in Q4. On the okay. second question on margin front, as I think I explained that also. Uh, look, uh, DAS and distribution um, are steady growth businesses. We experienced a high growth in Martech. DAS okay. grew fifteen percent, distribution grew twenty percent this year, whereas Martech grew around hundred hundred percent. So uh, there was a, a reduction in gross margin because Martech is a uh, slightly okay. lower uh, gross margin business than so only two. big changes you're saying yeah yeah and also if I can squeeze in one more what is the ESOP cost uh, reverse is there an ESOP cost reversal in Q4 uh, that we see and yeah that, that is a, yeah so there is a reversal because uh, there's an unvested portion of exited employees that we have to reverse okay so going forward this ESOP cost what could be for FI 23 or uh, what would the impact uh, in FI23 for ESOP cost? It will not be very significant uh, as such. Um, you know, most of the wasted ESOPs, uh, most of the ESOPs are wasted and we took those costs um, in the PNL uh, last year uh, when we went public. Uh, okay. So this year it will be, uh, you know, maybe in the in the range of two to three crore max. Two to three four, two to three crores. For the entire year. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay, that's it from my side. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Ashish Chopra from Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, two questions from my side. Uh, firstly, uh, Manu, if you could just share, you mentioned the LTV to CAC of 12.9. Uh, if you could just uh, split that out in terms of uh, what was your CAC last year was compared to pre COVID. And how should we expect that to trend going forward? You're talking about the customer acquisition cost? Yes. Okay. One second. So we we have been continuously seeing um uh improvement in our LTV to CAC uh exact CAC what it was uh, uh, during the pre-COVID levels. Let me dig that out. Uh, but I think the okay the one reason why the LTV to CAC has increased. Uh, I think it was pre-COVID level LTV to CAC was around eight, and it has increased to twelve point nine uh, this year. I, I think what the couple of things that is contributing to that is that we uh, we we had a we had a very large year. In terms of new contract wins, we closed around 104 crore of uh, new contracts. Uh, last year it was it was roughly around 30, 40 crore because the last was COVID impact. But pre-COVID, we used to close around 60, 70 crore or a 10 million dollar uh, range. Uh, so we there has been significant increase in uh, in sales efforts uh, with with lower cost. Uh, as, as I talked about pre-COVID levels, we had lesser employ uh, more employees than what we have now. Uh, so uh, the sales and marketing uh, effort uh, cost is is lesser uh, than what it is. I think one reason also factored in is that you know, people are selling out of India or not traveling, so travel cost is saved, uh, and we have kind of. Uh, recognize the fact is that uh, uh, that that can be an efficient way to sell. So um, so that is I think that's how it does improvement happen. 
Yeah, and, and if I if I may add, you know, one of the other things that's happening at Radian from a go-to-market perspective is, uh, as you might have seen with other SaaS companies, there's a transformation in the whole framework where what is referred to as a product-led model, uh, where you basically let the product sell itself. It's completely self-serve. Um, so you see, uh, you know, you've seen it with likes of Zoom, et cetera. So, you know, we are, I, I won't say we are, we are there yet, but we are making now investments also in how we go to market. So instead of being the traditional sales model of inside sales coupled with marketing and feed on the street, you know, we're trying to now become more and more of a product-led model which from a GTM perspective is extremely sales efficient. Um, uh, and, and, and that's why you're seeing some of the benefits of that. And, and we'll continue to move in that direction. We're not there completely, but we'll continue to move in that direction. So, so you're saying that these levels can be sustained uh, going forward as well? That's correct. Got it. And my second question was, uh, so when you mentioned that uh, the organic growth in MarTech next year could be 50%, uh, just to be clear on the definition there, so the business from my hotel shop, uh, would you consider that, consider that as entirely organic, considering that uh, it was not integrated for the full year in FY22? No, we'll do an apple to apple. I, I'm talking about an apple to apple comparison. So if I'm consolidating like you know seven months of my hotel shop, we'll, we'll report seven months growth only. Yeah. Understood. So so the reported number can be higher than ever. Yeah. Got it. That, that's very helpful. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. The next question is from the line of Ranjit Kopal K A from HSBC Asset Management. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I have a couple of questions. First one is on uh, the growth uh, that you mentioned about 30% organic growth. So uh, so in terms of what we are seeing from a industry perspective, we've seen clearly uh, recovery happening. So, uh, I mean, uh, in terms of our uh, growth assessment, uh, is it coming from the kind of contracts that we have signed uh, uh, over the course of FI22? or is it more on the confidence of the trajectory of improvement that we are seeing uh, currently? So if you can give some color on uh, the growth uh, that we are seeing, especially on the MarTech side, you mentioned about 50% growth. So uh, so how, how, how do you look at the color of the growth uh, in FI23 uh, is my sure. first question. Yeah. Sure, so let, let me take this on me. So when we talk about, you know, the growth drivers for FI23, see one is, just organically, now that we all know everybody's traveling, people are talking about revenge travel. So we're just seeing more volumes coming back. So when I talk about our DAS business, you know, we're seeing significant growth in our OTA customer segment. You know, they just want more data. Similarly, similarly on our uh, distribution business, as Sunmay pointed out, you know, we're seeing a lot more transactions. And to your point, you know, we did some very, very large deals in our distribution business, and I'm happy to report, you know, a lot of those deals have now been monetized, um, and as a result of which, we're actually seeing transaction volumes, you know, exceed pre-COVID levels in this quarter. Uh, the second thing that we are also seeing is these are suits that we had sold last year that I talked about, RG Labs, um, and you know, these are going to also drive growth, uh, especially Rev AI. It's been a great success for us uh, within the car franchising market. And we are seeing great amount of uh, traction on our demand AI product also. So um, we are also excited about, you know, what these products are doing. And we want to continue to invest in sales and marketing of some of these new products, you know, which we see. Uh, huge growth areas for us. Uh, and we're also encouraged by the reception that we've had on these new products that, you know, we are experimenting on some other product launches this uh, this year that we'll be able to talk about later in later quarters. And, um, you know, something that I've always talked about is, you know, we have a very, very large customer base. And, you know, now that things have opened up, we are ramping our investments 
uh, in sales and marketing in our martech business and really focusing on cross selling and upselling to our existing set of customers um so which which is the you know good growth um and you know we were in a pause situation because us open first and then as i pointed out in my opening remarks now we see asia and europe has lifted up also and in this uh march ending quarter we made significant in investments in ramping up our gdm infrastructure also so you know we see all across we will see as a result of that investment you know um additional go to market uh, push as well uh, and specifically in our das segment we are also uh, have now entered a chasing customer segments you know we all know about vacation rentals that we look up on airbnb it's become a big market and it's very organized now and we've had um some customers you know inquire and sign up on our das platform and similarly we also are seeing a lot of interest by destination management companies on our demand ai product so uh, there is an opportunity to get into these adjacent customer segments as well that should you know enable growth sure uh, thank you thank you for uh, for the elaborate answer uh, the for, the next question is on the, any inorganic initiative that we have uh, planned for fi 23 and uh, will it be around martech uh, so and uh, an amortization charge is around 23 24 for the past two years and will it be actually uh, in uh, it's on the similar lines uh, for fi 23 as well yeah so uh, i'll let tanmay address the second part of your question on the cost amortization um on the first part just general and i'm glad you asked that question uh generally i'll give you some commentary on our m&a endeavor so um you know when we evaluate first of all we run it as a proper program there is a dedicated team and we are constantly engaging with the marketplace for opportunities and we evaluate opportunities from a lens of you know three criteria one are these product capabilities that are pro- a part of our overall product vision to does it help us get deeper into certain geographies um, so we want to continue to you know get deeper in western markets us and europe uh, and we continue to look at opportunities where we can you know uh, get more customers and third opportunistically we want to look at uh, competitors something that i've commented on earlier is for each of our business lines we have different set of competitors there is not truly an apple to apple comparison to rate gain because most of these are point solutions so you know we opportunistically look at those as well because you know they can be very very synergistic for us uh, in terms of acquiring customers uh, and i'm happy to report that you know given the overall um, environment as you see especially in the us nasdaq market that um it's creating very very good opportunity so in terms of uh you know market opportunities in evaluating companies we've never seen a more robust pipeline uh, but at the same time i will say that you know we have demonstrated that we are very very disciplined about what we are willing to pay um so you know so the conversations are on um and there are multiple conversations and they actually um span all the criteria that i talked about and and these are all you know related to the different lines of businesses we have so i i want to say there is more than one opportunity per uh, business line that we have uh, as we evaluate currently thank you very much sir we'll move to the next question from the line i, I think there was, there was a second question on the amortization cost uh, right so uh, yes i think the fy23 also will have similar amortization cost for fy22 as fy22 it will go down uh, from fy24 onwards thank you the next question is from the line of vishnu kg from singular capital please go ahead yeah. hi sir thanks for the opportunity uh two questions from my side first on the market business could be call out the number of properties at the end of the fiscal year and uh, over the next 3 to 4 years how do you see this panning out your voice is coming a bit 
muffled. Why is it better? Uh, yeah, if you can go ahead now. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yes, sir. So my question was, uh, could you call out the number of properties in the market business at the end of FY22? And uh, will you think that over the next three to four years, uh, what is the number of properties that you think that we can target properly? And uh, second, more bookkeeping question, your working capital seems to have swelled in FY22. Anything particular to call out? Thank you. Uh, the, the first question was in terms of number of properties, right? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, we are talking about all the business units or any particular business. Actually, I was not. It was not very audible. Uh, sir, is this only Martech business? The number of properties over there. Martech business. Okay. Uh, so, uh, you know, these are like. Uh, uh, we have got two segments in MarTech business now. We got BCV, and we got uh, My Hotel Shop, uh, which is in Germany. Uh, BCV is close to uh, 375 properties uh, today, and My Hotel Shop is close to around 800 properties uh, today. Uh, so, wh was that the question? Uh, uh, did I answer the question in the first part? Okay, yes. uh, sorry, sorry about that. Vishnu, actually your voice is uh, very muffled. If you're using any earphones or external device, you can uh -huh. remove that and please go ahead. Or maybe uh, you, can, yeah. or you can email your questions because it's not very audible. Sure, sure. We'll do that. Yeah. Thank you. We'll move to the next question from the line of Sanjay Avatramani from Envision Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, good afternoon and uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, so, as you have just uh, given the answer for uh, properties in the MarTech business, so in the last con call you mentioned that uh, in the MarTech business we have 400 properties and in the short term we are planning for 1000 properties. So, can you clarify, I mean, how are we moving ahead in this and uh, what is the number we can expect uh, in the next uh, four to five years down the line, what are the properties we are expecting to be in with us? So yes, so um, so you're right. Um, you know, uh, so what we've seen is, you know, as we're going through, um, and and thanks to, you know, the education we're getting from public markets, there is a very very uh, large focus on uh, margin expansion, and as a result of which, in our Martech business, we saw there were some deals done because of the COVID situation at deep discounts. So as a result of which, you know, we, as we look to expand our margin, you know, we decided to let go of uh, some of these properties. And now we are very, very focused on ensuring that we uphold our prices and continue to, you know, actually expand on our prices so that we can have a margin expansion. So, you know, we, we saw a great addition to number of properties, but at the same time, you know, we did have uh, attrition of properties as well. As I mentioned, there were some, you know, low, um, uh, low priced uh, property engagements that we had. Um, our target uh, continues to be to get to, you know, all across. So our first target is to now, you know, as I mentioned, our Martec business is about selling both on social channels, which is ECV and social engagement and to, is also selling on digital channels. So our first target is to now have a much, much larger, uh, you know, cross-sell, upsell initiative where we can get hotels to be across both the platforms. Um, and, you know, overall target continues to remain, you know, to get to a thousand, but at the same time, you know, like I said, we are now extremely sensitive about driving our margins higher. Uh, so we've, you know, calibrated our efforts to focus first more on, you know, getting our margins to be higher uh, and, and driving, you know, sustainable growth forward. Okay, this is very clear, sir. And uh, last thing from my end that uh, for FY23, you have given a target of 12.5% of EBITDA margin. Is this correct? And the, and the second thing is on uh, Q4, you said that you'll be hiring uh, some um, senior team members or team leaders. 
So what is the margin impact on for this on Q1? No, uh, I think uh, the Q4 uh, we registered 11.7 percent. What I talked about is that uh, you know, we were expecting you know 50 basis point lesser margin because there were some new positions that could not be filled up and probably spill over to uh, Q1. Uh, but I think uh, as I say, like Q1 is uh, in terms of revenue and uh, you know profitability, it's 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 lesser than Q, Q2 or Q3 or Q4. So we'll start, uh, we're expecting around around a 10% uh, margin in, in Q1 and, and gradually increasing so that we average out around 12.5%. Okay, okay. Hello. Yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, sir. And the last one is that uh, MarTech is a high tech point business. Uh, and as we, I mean, work on pitches and uh, we need to be on the ground. So are we working on some campaign tweakings and uh, what is the scaling? I mean, how will we manage the people which will be required for this MarTech business? Sorry, can you uh, repeat the question? I... Uh, so I'll repeat my question. MarTech is a high touch point business. And uh, as we need to work on pitches, uh, for um, the marketing campaign, basically, basically to manage the marketing campaigns or tweaking them. So this will require a large team on the ground, right? And uh, plus, uh, we do require, I mean, unique campaigns to attract people on the rate gain platform or for the customers which we get on board, I mean, the hotels and the other intermediaries which we spoke about. So how we are uh, planning to manage the scale or uh, how many people will be required in the future to uh, move ahead with the smart tech business. Yes, correct. So that's a great observation. You're right. This is a, a more managed service part of our business uh, versus being, you know, completely a platform play. So, we, you know, the analogy that I usually use is we provide the platform or the car, but we also give you the chauffeur or the driver to drive the car. Um, so, you know, our goal is to do two things really. One, we want to continue to uh, stitch together everything that we have into one platform and make this platform a lot more intelligent. That's a, you know across the industry because we are able to have a lot of these nuggets. Like you know, we know how travel demand is trending. We know how your competitors and your distributors are distributing your price. So all that information is absolutely critical in driving a much, you know, smarter ad spend so that you can drive a much better ROI. So the fact that, you know, we are the only company that can pull all of this together thanks to the integration of that and distribution components we see that the value that we can charge on each of these customers, we can continue to drive much higher uh, ticket price as we sort of move forward and stitch all of this together. Now, the second thing that we are really focusing on is, you know, automating and productizing, you know, some of these managed service elements such that, you know, the number of people is not completely linear to the number of hotels that we had. And we, you know, we're happy to get um, offline with you and provide you some statistics where we are seeing, you know, the number of people, uh, the number of hotels that each team, me team member can support is increasing as we look to automate and productize a lot of these tasks. Thank you. Sanjay, I would request you to please come back in the queue. Okay, okay, thanks. The next question is from the line of Karan Upal from Philip Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, Manu, uh, one question is on the uh, the if you can provide uh, any color on the new products which you have launched, uh, Rev AI, Demand AI, and Content AI. Uh, what is the market response from these new products? Uh, and any contribution you are expecting uh, in the 30% organic growth guidance which you have given? Yeah, sure. So um, very quickly, what uh, Demand AI does is basically gives you a sense of how travel demand is in any particular market. So 
you know, think of Delhi and we will say in the month of June, we give it a score on a scale of 1 to 100, that travel demand is going to be, let's say, 90, which means it's going to be high. And using that information, you know, hoteliers can do two things. One, they can decide, you know, how, how they want to price their product. If the demand is going to be high, they can increase the rates. And that's what we're seeing across markets, right? Because the demand is high, they're increasing rates. And B, you know, they can also plan uh, to optimally staff up, you know, their, uh, their hotel. And three, you know, it's also useful information on how you do your sort of digital marketing. So we're seeing some very, very good traction on demand AI. As I mentioned earlier, we signed up uh, one of the largest uh, hotel chains in Spain. We've also signed up, uh, you know, a lot of these that I refer to DMOs, uh, you know, think of Visit Dubai, Oman Tourism, all these, uh, you know, big uh, tourism boards that are supported by the different governments to attract tourists. They're also keen to understand how travel demand is, uh, you know, working out in their area. So it wasn't, you know, something that we targeted, but incidentally, you know, it's taken a huge liking by um, a lot of these uh, PMOs. In fact, um, you know, we are also seeing as big events happen, uh, the tourism boards of those events, whether it's FIFA or World Cup, also showing a lot of interest. So it's opened up an adjacent segment for us. Um, and on Rev AI, what it does is it takes demand AI and our competitive intelligence solution from that and puts all of it together and goes one step further and makes a recommendation on how you price. So we actually tell our customer how they should price. So you guys are going to hate me, but, you know, if, we are, if you're seeing increase in prices, maybe some of it is as a result of people using rate gate software because we see there is increased demand but not as much inventory and we recommend our customers to increase. So we're doing that for, we deliberately decided to go after the car rental franchisee market because we see that as a white space and greenfield opportunity. And, um, you know, I'm happy to report just within the first year of launch and just six months of marketing, we signed up about a million dollars ACV in, in Rev AI. And then Content AI is a content distribution management and content augmentation tool because, uh, you know, what hotels also, as I talked about, are suffering from this great resignation. They are unable to provide updated content on what are health and safety protocols. Now there's a lot of talk about sustainability. So we provide an automated tool through which hotels can update content with their third party partners and also enhance the quality of the images. So on all these products, you know, we are at different stages um, of evolution. I would say Rev AI is where we have seen, uh, you know, great traction. Um, and I think we are in the, you know, final stage of getting to having the product market fit before we start to scale. Um, in terms of the 30% uh, growth margin, uh, the, the growth uh, percentage, what contribution this would have, I'll let uh, Samay comment on it. Tanmay Das, are you able to hear that? Yeah, I, I'm actually missed the last part. The, the comment 30 percent, we want it. Uh, what is the contribution of the new products in our revenue growth in the 30 percent? Yeah, it will be roughly around four percent. Okay, yeah. okay, thanks, thanks, thanks for the detailed answer. Uh, the second question was uh, on your transaction business. Uh, right now, it is around 20 to 25 percent of the overall revenue. But uh, uh, with, with a very strong demand, uh, travel demand, which is there uh, currently. So this can this transaction business go up to maybe 35 to 40 percent of revenue at the end of FY23? Oh, well, if obviously if the demand goes through the roof, obviously we will be beneficiary of that. But I can't predict that today. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Uh, and this, Sorry, this last one bookkeeping. Uh, sir, I will uh, please, please email it. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank sure, you. Sure. 
The next question is from the line of Manish Dhariwal from Fiducia Capital Advisors. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. I had uh, one question on uh, the working capital position of the company, uh, which, uh, you know, when I look at the trade and other receivables uh, shooting up and also uh, some significant write-offs. So you have some color on that. And my second question was that, you know, how many properties, like, you know, we have some 2,400 uh, customers, companies that we are working for. So how many hotels does that translate into? So you've given some numbers on the MarTech side, but then on the total thing, uh, if you could just give us a flavor. Yeah, sure. So taking the first question, look, uh, the the working cap, we have a, had a large quarter in terms of revenue. Uh, the, the revenue increased by 51%, which is around a 36, cro 36 crore or 37 crore increase in revenue uh, as against the last quarter. Uh, last, uh, last quarter of last year. So we have a large data balance uh, that was accumulated because of the, the billings that happened in Q4, which is getting collected in Q1. Um, and um, which is, in, uh, if you talk about a percentage of revenue, uh, it will be the same for last year and this year. So, uh, so that's, that's fine. The, the, the question on write-offs, if you see, uh, you know, the, the, the last last year, it was higher because of COVID year. Uh, we had to give discounts, waivers, and all. We had some slippage to this year of those, which we have taken care of now. Uh, but I think it is uh, generally we, uh, in a good year, it is around a 1% uh, of revenue that we experience as, as write-offs. Uh, in a bad year, it's around 2% of revenue that we experience. Uh, I think the COVID year has been a little bit slight higher, but this year it is within that limit. And we expect to, uh, we now have cleaned up all COVID related issues now, and we expect to improve it for the next year. The other question you had was on the properties. Uh, look, it's different in different uh, segments. Um, the, for an example, a distribution segment, um, we have got like, uh, the Marriotts of the world or the, or the big chains of the world who have like connected to multiple chain, uh, multiple hotels up there. So distribution segment itself caters to around 130,000 hotels. Uh, but not all hotels might be producing because uh, they, 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 they are connected with us, basically. Uh, on, on that segment, there would be around 3,000 properties with us. Uh, so in total, if you're talking about, I think we, we connect or, or provide solution to around uh, 140,000 odd hotels. Oh, wonderful, thank wonderful. You, uh, Manish, yeah. uh, thank you very much. We'll move to the thank next you. question. The next question is from the line of Rahul Jha from, Rahul Jha from Bay Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, can you give us how much revenue was contributed by my hotel shop for the full year and for this quarter? And secondly, uh, on the MarTech new client addition, wh what portion is due to this acquisition of my hotel shop and what is organic? Well, overall basis, I, as I talked about, uh, we grew 46% year over year, right? And if I just take out uh, Marte and uh, my hotel shop, then we grew around 30% organically, and 16% was contributed by my hotel shop. Uh, if that answers your question. Right. And for the new client addition in my in Martec, uh, the the 104 crore we had a very uh, because uh, we acquired the company in October, and there were like three months of cross training and all. So uh, there will be very in you know not a very significant amount of new sales from my, my hotel sub recorded. It is primarily the existing client uh, uh, expanding the growth came in. So, yeah. And on the, on the uh, receivables front, I, would, I see that like uh, some 16, 17 gross receivables have increased. But actually, if you look at uh, quarter on quarter, uh, if you look at say from uh, December to March, December 21 to March 22, 
receivables have increased by 17 crores, but your revenue has actually increased by 7 8 crores. So, what is really happening here? Well, uh, obviously, uh, the the increase uh, against uh, December 21, uh, so we, we grew around 9% uh, sequentially, uh, and that is a 7 crore increase, right? Uh, so the, 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 the DSO of the company is around 80 days. It went up to 105 days uh, in the COVID time. Uh, in pre-COVID, it was around 60 days. So it has obviously gradually decreasing from 105 days to come down to 80 days, and it's going to further decrease on that. Uh, there are certain large clients uh, which where we have agreed for a extended pay period, which still continues, and we are trying to negotiate to bring it down further. Uh, but as long as the uh, you know we reduce the DSO going forward, the situation will improve further. Thank you very much. Thank you. Due to time constraints, this was the last question for today. I now hand the conference over to management for closing comments. Mr. Banu Chopra, you may proceed with the closing comments. Yes, um, so um, I, I just wanted to thank everybody uh, who took the opportunity to participate on the call today. I hope we've been able to give you a good overview about our company, insight into the performance thus far and the growth story that lies ahead. Uh, more, moreover, I hope we have answered all your questions appropriately. And if there are anything uh, that anybody else wanted to ask, please feel free to contact our uh, partner, SGA, and uh, they can relay the questions to us, and we'll be happy to also jump on a call if required. So thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. On behalf of Reed Gain Travel Technologies Limited, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us, and you may now disconnect your lines.